This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. To make this show what it is, I have to talk to people in person, face to face, not on Skype or on the phone. That means I have to travel around the country and find recording spaces wherever I go. That's expensive. And so far, this show is entirely supported by the contributions of listeners. So if you want to keep it going, please do me a favor and go to unregisteredunderground.com. When you become a subscriber there, you'll have access to a private Facebook group where you can talk with me and with guests from the show. You'll also get discounts on unregistered and renegade university merchandise. So again, to support this show and to keep it going, please go to unregisteredunderground.com. I was excited and I have to say a little surprised when Seth Stevens Davidowitz agreed to be interviewed by me. His new book, which is called Everybody Lies, contains several amazing analyses of Google search data, and I was fascinated by it. But he had already been reviewed by all the mainstream liberal media outlets, and Seth had done interviews with NPR, the Freakonomics podcast, MSNBC, and CBS This Morning. But as he told me, he had been asked a lot of questions already about what he had found out about the secret thoughts of Americans, but no one had ever asked him the questions I wanted him to answer. So in my field in, in history, I'd say in academia generally, but in history in particular, the academic field of history, they tend to be quite uh, conservative in a lot of ways. And they tend also not to know what's going on in the world too much. So they, they're sort of the last to find out about the latest technology, <laughs> right? And and I, I, you know, I hey, I was into pop culture always and just sort of paying attention, not that I was a tech person or anything, but I, I began to think that, gosh, we have all this information out there like and what new ways to study people like to study so what we call social history or contemporary social history yeah. in a sense right um uh meaning data online you know and my first thought was about porn because I'm, I'm i write a lot about sex and the history of sexuality so i thought well like and then pornhub actually started having like analytics or they have this analytics whole section you can go to they count like all sorts of things that are fascinating you know and to me, for porn, certainly, but I thought for that kind of data, it's like the collective unconscious of a society, right? These are things that people don't say, but that they think, right? That they're, they feel like they're not allowed to say or they stop themselves from saying, but that it's a way to record. Is that a collective unconscious or a collective unspoken? Well, right. That's a, good, that's a good point. I mean, a good question. I don't know. You might be right that it could be the latter. Anyway, this is this is Seth Stevens Davidovitz, Davidovitz, sorry, who's written um, the book that I thought should have been written, which he didn't just do porn data. He did. He, you analyzed in your book the uh, Google search terms, right? And Google Google search data. And the book is called Everybody Lies. And I think that he started something that's going to be standard pretty soon among everyone, but in particular academics, when they finally find out about this stuff, because it's a great way, I think. And now, I mean, to study, to study a society now, you know, there's the data and then there's what you do with the data, meaning how you interpret it. And also, of course, you know, in terms of policy or whatever, right. But as, as da usable data, I think it's absolutely fascinating and important. And so I, first of all, I just want to say thank you for doing that. You pioneered this and I really think it's going to be it's going to change the way most social science is done, don't you? Uh, yeah, I, I think it, it'll probably take. I mean, I, I'm kind of like you. I don't. I didn't really understand why everybody wasn't doing this. Amazing, right? Like, I know. Yeah, so it's kind of like 
I'm still kind of not sure. It is like happening a little more, but it's, it moves so slowly. Like you don't, if you reach a, a sociology journal or like a sex journal, they're not like, they're not like, I, I, I did analyze Pornhub data. And like I asked them, I'm, like, hmm. I just thought it would be like, they'd be like, have like a whole team, how they're dealing with academics and they'd be like getting requests all the time. <laughs> right. and just like, no, like, no. Yeah. I think a few grad students are because there are people probably huh. who are le- like, if you're, I think you're a grad student, you haven't been like told all the normal methods. It's just like, oh, you want to understand sexuality? Like, let's look at porn. Like, duh. Yeah. Uh, but like professors, like very, very rare, not like pretty much nobody was looking at it. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's weird. Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, on a basic level, it's like porn or searches for porn things, things in porn is essentially in the aggregate is an index of desires. I think definitely. Yeah. Okay, good. (laughs) Right. I thought so too. Yeah. I mean, uh, like, yeah, there, there are weak. I think also you have, uh, it's a little messy. Like people have built their careers around how like weight surveys, but I mean, the thing with surveys is surveys are also like, uh, they have their own problems. Yeah. They have their own problems, but like, because people throw their careers to them, like they have acceptable names to deal with them. Whereas, uh, you know, I think the, new methodologies like uh they, they haven't really the, 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 they haven't really like uh become <laughs> accepted so once they're not accepted like people really focus on the flaws well, one of the great things you do in the book is that you show you know the difference the differences between what surveys on a topic show and what google search term data shows on a topic yeah, yeah, right yeah. so like for instance with porn yeah you know do you watch porn right yeah you, you i did can't this. believe the surveys how low they are of course like I, yeah, I don't know. It's maybe it's it's also I think cultural because I don't think like I think most of my friends would be very open about w- watching porn, but it's like t- it's like twenty five percent of men and like seven percent of women say in surveys they watch porn. Yeah, this was a, a a small criticism that I had of what you're saying in the book. Um, it's not you're you're not totally wrong, but I think there's a kind of a contradiction a little bit in what you're saying about that. Anyway, so what you show is. Or you show that surveys show that people, when asked in surveys, do they watch porn, right? It's very low. So the numbers you just cited, yeah. right? Um, and then, but when you look at Google search data and Pornhub analytics, it's what? Like, what do you... Well, you, it's not, that's not really a one-to-one comparison because we don't know. Right. All we know is the aggregate. There are more searches for porn than weather in the United well, States, <laughs> which uh, yeah. which says that, like, you know, you don't, we don't know exactly what percent of people, but it's probably, it, and that it, it's probably, per, you know... The majority, the large majority of men, and then uh, you know, women, it, it is still a little bit lower. What, yeah, what what do the surveys show on men? Like, what do what do men say when asked this in surveys? Like twenty five percent. Twenty five percent of men watch, watch porn. Say they watch porn. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's like close to a hundred. Yeah, now. I mean, I, don't, I think it is changing because I think it's it may become something like cigarettes, where people are like, this is not potentially a great. Yeah. Uh, like, I think there are le- legitimate ways in which porns changing society and oh, yeah. changing sexuality in ways that aren't necessary. Like I'm not a prude, but I think that, uh, it is having potentially uh, negative effects and it mm. may become something like a, a cigarette where people are like, you shouldn't, you know, that you shouldn't be allowed to do this cause it's going to negatively affect. Wait, you think porn might be as dangerous as cigarettes? Not for like actual health, but for like, I think like a lot of like men, uh, younger men are like, like, I think, don't enjoy like normal sex hmm. or can't appreciate normal sex yeah. because porn has taken things to such an extreme level. I've heard that. I've heard that theory and I'm not that I don't reject. Um, I've heard other claims about the effects of porn on society, which have pretty much, pretty much been disproven. But I, that one, I actually, I'm sympathetic to that. And I think that should be explored. I do think that, or maybe we'll just, they'll just invent sex robots yeah. that give people perfect, per- perfect pleasure. And then nobody's going to have human sex. Anymore. Well, you know what? I mean, actually you look at Japan and you know about what's going on in yeah. sort of sexual culture of young Japanese. They yeah. are not having real sex anymore. I mean, yeah. the, the birth rate is declining. Well, also the other thing I learned in tremendously Pornhub, in Japan, Pornhub data is more than 10% of por- male Pornhub searches in Japan or for tickling, which is, yeah, yeah which, you know, it's very, so, you know, I'm, I, I think it's a decent, decent argument that that's where this could take us in a way. But then, then again, I'm not sure that's necessarily bad. In other words, I'm not going to tell the Japanese that what they're doing is wrong. You know, that that's a worse society. I, I it's not what I want to live in currently, but you know, I don't know, maybe who knows. Um, 
But anyway, so you, you know, it's pretty clear from Google search data and other data about porn, but certainly Google search data that it's obvious that men are lying. Yeah. Everybody lies. And yeah. certainly men do when they talk about porn yeah, consumption, 25% yeah. of men watch porn. No, no, yeah. no, it's massive. So like, do you have like rough, like big numbers for porn? Uh, well, just that porn is more searched for weather and mm -hmm. that, uh, and I, I think, uh, you know, you kind of just do that. Okay. Well, what percent of people check the weather uh, close to hundred percent? Yeah. Right. Uh, so the, uh, well, I don't think there's any way to know exactly, uh, what percent of people do though. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, like, okay. So how do you interpret that? The porn versus the, weather? The, no, the difference between the survey results and the, and the, well, there are some ways where it's even more clear. So like, if you look at, uh, what percent of people say that they are racist mm -hmm. or like you have a direct question do you care or do you care that Obama is black mm -hmm. and like when, when he was running and like, nobody says yes. But then you see in Google searches, which I, I talk about in the book, like racist searches, uh, almost in parts of the country, almost perfectly predict where Obama did worse than other Democrats. You can calculate like he lost, you know, about 10% of the white vote from, from racism, right. Uh, which is like, it, it's serving two 2%. Or if you ask people, did you vote in an election? Like right after an election, yep. uh, I think, uh, more than, uh, half of people who don't vote, uh, more than half of people don't vote, say that they voted. So like, that's a direct comparison. You see, like, yep. you know, they voted like, you yeah, ministry voting, decadent yeah, survey voting. Let's, I, we're going to do the race thing. I'm going to come back to that though. Cause that's very important. I definitely want to get to that, but I just want to stay on the porn thing and the sex thing. So, so there's, um, you know, your data just is great. And that it shows that porn is way more popular and consumed than we are led to believe and that we will admit right publicly. So to me, that says that there is an anti-sex or sort of, I guess you could say puritanical element in our society that's still powerful, right? We're still shaming this thing, even though I know you said there it is. Was, well, there's yeah, also, okay. there's kind of an interesting thing. I also did data on how much sex people have. Right. Exactly. And that they exaggerate. People ex say they have more sex than they actually right. have. So if you compare how many condoms people say they ha use to how much se condoms are actually purchased, there are way more condoms. And if you, if you say even how much unprotected sex people have, if they really were having sex with no contraception with the frequency they did with women of pregnancy age, there'd be more pregnancies every year. So like, uh, so, so it's kind of give the numbers, you have the numbers on this, right? Yeah. So like the condoms that I think heterosexual men say they use 1.1 billion condoms every year. And a heterosexual woman say they use 1.1 billion condoms every year in heterosexual sexual encounters. And men say they use 1.6 billion condoms every year in heterosexual sexual encounters. And those by definition have to be the same, right? Mm -hmm. See, like you're, you already know that people are lying. Mm -hmm. Then Nielsen tracks all the condoms sold in the United States at 600 million. Mm -hmm. so it's like nowhere close. So people are just exaggerating. Right. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so in other words, that's showing that people have less sex than they're saying. Yeah. Have, which is like, which would be anti pure Yeah. So it's kind of like, so it's kind of weird. Like, I think there are pressures for people to be having sex. Yeah. Like nobody wants to say, oh, like, I'm uh, I'm not having any sex or like, on the, but like, don't, people don't want to say like, I'm watching like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, incestual videos on porn. Yeah. There, they're, they're not going to say like, yeah, totally. The one small thing I would say that's small criticism about your, um, I think you're right. I think your interpretation of that data on, um, people, you know, the condoms and the, you know, how much sex they say they're having. I think that's right that they overstate it. But the one small thing I would say is just that there's other forms of birth control. Did you take in? Well, no, I said, yeah, but then if you do the. In the surveys where people say like they use no contraception at all mm. and they're having like consistent sex with like, uh, you know, like uh, with women of pregnancy age, then you do the math on like what scientists say, how frequently people should get pregnant. There'll be more pregnancies okay. every year. So like, got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Then, then I'm totally convinced. Yeah. And then, then you're a hundred percent right about that. So, so there you go. Isn't that weird? Like I, at one point you say that the, um, that that's evidence of our sex obsessed culture that, you know, right. People would overstate how much sex they have. And that, I think you're right. That would be evidence for that claim. Yeah. But then also like your next claim or next, what you show really is that people are afraid to talk about their porn consumption, you know, which tells me that there's something else going on. Just, I'm just yeah. seeing, I'm but just it's seeing also like what's, yeah, it's just like what's considered cool and what isn't considered cool. Right. So like, mm -hmm. yeah. I think, uh, you know, I think like porn obsession people won't admit, but I think also people won't admit that maybe like they watch Netflix on a Saturday night or something instead of like, they might, I, I'm not sure I'd have to see, but I think I would guess that people like exaggerate how frequently they're like doing something of like, so, so, like social value. Yeah. Like, yeah, so, yeah. or just like, yeah. Like how frequently are you just like spending nights by yourself or like how much are you alone? Just like watching TV or something. You know what you didn't do? I don't think you did this in the book and I would love, <laughs> I wish you had, and I would love it if you would do it at some point, do this on work, ask people how much they work in a week. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And people, I think, well, I think people spend a lot of time in the office, but like, I think people exaggerate 
how frequently they're actually doing work. So you don't, we don't have the data on that and you didn't do this, but you know, so that would tell me that this culture says that work is good. Yeah. Yeah. So like we're work obsessed in a sense, or we value work socially, right? Which is interesting. Yeah. But also on sex though, to me, what you're showing is not that we are either a sex obsessed culture or a puritanical culture. I think what you're showing, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, is that we are just conflicted, deeply conflicted about sex in particular, right? Well, the, what's acceptable and what isn't acceptable. Yeah, exactly. You just change like, right. you know, you take like the gay thing. Mm -hmm. I, I talk about this book as well. Like, okay, it's kind of flipped that it's okay to like have uh, preferences mm -hmm. for people of the same sex. If you like grew up in Berkeley or you grew mm -hmm. up in like New York City or you're a professor or like a you know, yep. doctor, a respectable member of society mm -hmm. and you say I'm homosexual today, that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. Like, but if you say, let's say I'm 25 years old and I'm attracted to elderly women, <laughs> I think that would be... Mm -hmm. considered very different and like you, you'd and i think most men i've done the math and most men in that situation stay in the closet no matter what part of the united states they're in so there are lots of areas yep. uh where we, we are accepting but there are still definitely areas uh, where we're not accepting so it's definitely conflict a lot of conflict there yeah absolutely um speaking of that so i think it's the fastest growing genre in porn or certainly one of the fastest growing genres of porn is incest and you show this yeah right you show that that's one of the yeah one of the top search terms right? i was shocked by this mm -hmm. uh, well i was first shocked at this when i was watching porn and i'm like the, <laughs> the main site on mainstream so i think the shocking thing about porn is like if you actually go to porn which i admit i do although i am trying to quit because of the same because i think mm. I, I do think it's not a it's good, harming you i don't think it's a good thing do you, but, well, wait, hold on. Do you, you really think it's harming you? Yeah. Huh. Like, I you, think, are you preferring, you think you're going to end up preferring porn to real sex? I already, I think I already do. Oh, really? Yeah. And I think I, uh, huh. so I'm kind of like, uh, huh. I kind of, uh, I'm trying, I'm, I, so, 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 so I'm, 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 I'm trying to, to quit, but I, uh, but I was, but it, I think it's, it's kind of just mind blowing. Like now it, it, it happens. So over time. So if you go to like a porn hub main site, it's just like, okay, that's what it sh sh should be. Of course, there'll be like anal sex and son and stepmom mm -hmm. and like, uh, just like, you know, obese woman and what, all this stuff like, the, oh, of course, like that's, that's what sex is. But like 20 years ago, like sexual male sexual desire was like Playboy magazine. Yep. Like, that was what male sexual desire was. And like mm -hmm. the main site of a main, totally mainstream sites are just nothing like that. Yeah. Go to Pornhub, everyone right now and type in mom <laughs> in the search bar. And you'll see how many videos do you think? Uh, a lot. Just no, so it's like, so something like, uh, like of the top 100, 100 searches that men make, like something about, something like, it's like 15 of them, maybe 19 of them are incestual. Whoa. And like some of them are step, but some of them aren't like stepmom, which uh -huh. makes a little more sense for then It's like mom and son and then like brother and sister and like real brother and sister. And it's like. So this is 20% of searches. Yeah. Are for incest. Yeah, but then the watching Porn. videos are the same. Watching videos are the same. It's like it's something. It's insane. It's like definitely more than ten percent. Like now so, are incestual. So wouldn't that tell us? Am I right about this? You're the statistician, son. That that would probably mean that more than twenty percent of porn consumers are well. You don't, at some I mean, point, you, at some you point, consumers. You don't, you don't know for sure because it could be. You know, we don't know. Like, no, no. Yeah, like you know, it could be a hundred percent based on that, or yeah. it could be one percent who's just on right. porn all could, day. And could obsessed. be multiple offenders. It could be. It could be like two guys who just are obsessed with their mom and driving all their. That's own. true. Okay. <laughs> no, it's, it's not. We actually know it's not that because geographically, it's it's more country. Oh, really? Well, it's like it's the same in all parts of the oh really country in the world. So it's not like. Uh, so it's definitely not that, but uh, you, we don't know exactly how much it is, but it is like, it is very high. And then I think I also said that the top searches I want to have sex with. Or like dominated by incestual on Google. Oh wow! Or like oh, I want to sex with my mom. I forgot about that part in your book. Yeah, that's right. And it's not oh, like it doesn't. It's still kind of a small number, also because it's like kind of a very specific search. Like it's not <laughs> clear why you're making it. But and then it's it's like you kind of think that search you're going to make if you if you're having a thought that you're like a little weirded out by, right? Yeah. Are you checking it's an auto yeah? I want to do this right now. They, I don't know if they have it on autocomplete. Oh, but they, oh, they block those things. They, sometimes they block it. Yeah. Oh wow. But if you, if you want to say I want to sex with my mom, you'll get like it's not like jokes. It's it'll be like I'm pretty sure like real message boards with people describing whether it's normal and stuff. Like <laughs> this is really funny. You know what they have now? But I want to have sex with and here's the three: you, you quotes. I don't know what that means. And the third one is my boyfriend. Yeah, I think they. And they that's it. Block. They only yeah, show I three. They block, I think they block. Them. Look how you know. 
uh, queer theorists would tell you this is so heteronormative, yeah. right? This yeah. is, this is like what we want as our, you know, the yeah, formal yeah. culture of America. Yeah. This is all completely good and yeah. safe and respectable. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, wow. I didn't yeah. know that Google blocked that stuff. Yeah. Not only blocked it, but like shaped it. I'm sure yeah. they chose these three, right? You Probably. romantic, right? This yeah. romantic love, right? And my boyfriend yeah. because yeah, it's so sweet when, yeah. they, when they want to have sex with us. Yeah. Oh, wow, man. So incest. So goddamn, dude, that's like explosive that you would even go there. You know what yeah, I mean? But, you would ask that question and, and, would, and then you would show the results. Oh, uh, I mean, well, no, I didn't ask the question. It was just like, or I, it came uh, to you, but I well, just, no, it's not. It's just, I was like looking at the, I got this data from Pornhub on the top mm -hmm. searches and yeah. it's just like the most striking thing. It's like, okay. Like, I know I'm just saying it, it's, it's still something that you would continue you know, with this and then put it, put it in a book and publish it and talk about it in public. Well, because I, I was talking a lot about, I was talking a lot about uh, Freud in the book. So right. I figured like, love that. I figured if you, uh, he is kind of the poster child for making like <laughs> unrespectable yeah. ideas perfectly fine I know, for that, scientific yeah. inquiry. I know that's like the frame <laughs> for the book and I love it because I'm, I'm basically, I'm, I basically operate with the Freudian analysis about repression and you know it's discontent well i think he's right about a lot of things but like like i i complain that he just didn't have data so it's like right. you can't really they made shit up this is all theory yeah it was all just like here's yeah. what i think about the world yeah and based like, on my four <laughs> patients yeah. you know and myself like uh -huh. oh, i once fantasized about my mom I'm exactly sure lots of other people do but apparently on that one he might be right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah uh yeah as I, I think what you're showing is i think you're showing repression and what he called the return of the repressed. In other words, you're showing, you know, by these contradictions, like between, you know, how many people say they watch porn, right. how many people actually watch porn. That's the repression part yeah. that you're showing with that contradiction in the, in the data. And then you're also showing that so many people in the society are doing things against the repression. They're doing things they're not supposed to do. Right. I mean, so many. So, yeah. So one of the things I also find really interesting is if you look at, this is sort of related, but I find this really interesting because I think it tells us a lot about mental illness. Maybe mm -hmm. You might be on stay in sex, <laughs> but if you look at so we're talking about porn addiction, this reminds me like the place that actually has the lowest consumption of porn is Utah, which <laughs> kind of goes against repression. Cause I think like porn's like really not allowed. They, they legitimately mo like a lot of people don't, don't watch porn there, but it's also the place with the number one search for uh, porn addiction. Yes. So, so they're like, so it's kind of weird. It's kind of interesting how like, uh, people who watch the least porn are the most convinced that they have an addiction problem. Mm -hmm. cause, Cause I think a lot of our uh, ideas about mental illness aren't really correct in that it's a lot of how you think about yourself. Mm -hmm. So like if you get a test for ADHD, you're like, do you lose your keys often? And I think whether you answer yes or no to that it tells you much more about what you, how you often you think someone's supposed to lose your keys than how often you lose your keys. Right. And whether you think you have porn addiction tells you much more about whether you think how much porn is supposed to be watched versus how much porn you actually watch. And I think that's true for like a lot of these mental illness and how we diagnose mental illness. Uh, and that we might actually be able better, have a better job of diagnosing mental illness, not by asking people questions of where they fall in the spectrum, but actually just using data from their lives. Like, okay, how many times did you actually lose your iPhone yeah. uh, in a given time? And just like actually follow them through life and put them on a distribution yeah. and not just saying like <laughs> asking them these questions, which tells you, which I don't think tell you, that much yeah exactly you know actually you know keep track of their behavior yeah what they actually do yeah, yeah not no. what they think they should be doing yeah um you know these this addiction thing this category really problematic for me and a lot of people of course but you know how you define it and the whole sex, sex addiction thing i think is really I, I don't buy it at all and i think it actually is really basically a reactionary conservative concept porn addiction probably the same thing however you know to me, the useful definition of addiction is, you know, something that gets in the way of the life you want to live. Right. So maybe like in your case, I suppose, sounds like porn, you, I mean, according to you, it was stopping you from doing something that you want to do, right? The life you want, it's getting in the way. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think you could say that. It sounds, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's fine. Like I get that. And if you want to attack that, great, go for it. So I, yeah, I totally get that. Um, but yeah, Utah shows uh, a, a great the greatest concern for sex, I mean, for porn addiction, but the right? lowest, consumption. but the lowest consumption of it. Yeah. So the most repression and maybe yeah. the most return of the repressed. Yeah. Something like that. I yeah. Don't know. Right. Yeah. Cause that's what Freud's theory was that we, the civilization necessarily represses all these desires, yeah, yeah, yeah. the ids for yeah, yeah. desire for sex and violence and all that stuff. But he says that, you know, 
it, it can only be partially successful at yeah. that, that these, these desires for these bad things will come out in other ways and often in worse ways. So instead of just wanting to have normal sex, you're going to end up wanting to have sex with your mother, which is the, for him, like the fundamental taboo that civilization needs to create. Right. Like taboo, like civilization, you know, is derived primarily or first from that taboo because the family is a hierarchy, right? There's mom, dad, and the children, it's very clear who's on the top and who's on the bottom. So when they're all having sex with each other, like they did, you know, in pre-modern times, which is very common. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, you didn't know this? No. Oh, yeah. I mean, historians can't prove it because it's just a lack of evidence. But what we do know is that there's just no discourse about incest. There's no concern about it anywhere that we found. We have found no one. Ish, uh, I thought the incest taboo was considered universal. No, 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 no. I mean, no, it's, it's yeah, no, there's simply no evidence of any concern in any society that I'm aware of before about the 18th century. Yeah. About incest. And then in the 18th, but especially in the 19th century, it becomes like an obsession. Like incest becomes the worst thing. Pedophilia becomes the worst thing. Before then there was, there's simply no evidence that people cared about it. Really? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's pretty common among historians. It's a common belief. That, but they, they know that people are actually doing, how do they know people are doing? Plus we also have some, we have substantial records of people, certainly in Europe where the records were kept about these things, meaning like diaries and people would observe things and write things down about what they saw. Oh yeah. And then, you know, people were writing in their memoirs later as adults about what childhood was like and mom and dad were in the bed and so were the kids and things would happen. And oh yeah. And then also from genealogy records, we know that, you know, it's pretty damn common. Well, I guess just in general, like with less privacy and stuff. Sure. Clearly, like, sure. if nothing else, all kids were probably watching their parents having sex. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's another, right. That's, that's part of the taboo, right? We're supposed to wall children off from sex, right? Any, any, bef until they're 18, anything that's sexual is going to harm them, we assume, right? So seeing or hearing your parents have sex is, is damaging, we assume. By the way, I, I heard my father have sex all the time from the age of five until 18. Really? All the time. Yeah. And he was unashamed about it. So this is one of the reasons I'm very curious about all this because people have always assumed when I tell them that, that I must be damaged by that. And I, I'm damaged by a lot of things he did and who he was, but I'm pretty sure that's the one thing he did that didn't damage me. I could be wrong, but I don't, I don't see it. But there's an interest, the assumption that it would damage me or harm me is what's most important, right? That's yeah. a cultural assumption, which is unproven. Yeah. So, yeah, you got, I mean, I yeah. think, yeah, you got to think if it was around for so long, it can't be that harmful. <laughs> I mean, see, Seth, this is what you, this is what you try to do with this book. You're trying to subvert this culture, weren't you? You're trying to bring down our civilization by forcing all of our children to have sex with their mothers. <laughs> no, but actually, in a way, it is radical what you're doing here. You're showing, no, it's, it's truly radical. You're just simply showing. And it's just, it's just facts. It's just data. That a uh, big portion of the American population wants to have sex with their mom. <laughs> Seriously, right? Wants incest. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. If I, I would, I'd probably agree. I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if like, uh, I would say that a big portion of the population wants to consistently have sex with their mom. I, I don't know. It's no, a little no. hard to interpret. No, it. just simply that it's a desire that they I would say that, have. I would say that that's a, a somewhat, I would say that the percentage of people who've had that type of desire at some point is probably pretty high based on the data. Yeah. Okay. Out. That's, that's it. But that's, so think about that though, right? Yeah. That's, that's pretty massive, <laughs> that information, right? You know, cause that's the main taboo. I mean, that's just about the worst thing you can do. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess, I guess it is more. You think people are afraid of uh, speaking about how they watch porn? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ask people in a survey right? Do you want to have sex with your mom? Hey, Gallup have you, or, or, or have Pew you Research. Desired? Ask, do that in a survey, the incest survey. Have you ever wanted to have sex with your mom? What do you think <laughs> the percentage would be <laughs> saying yes? Well, so you always have a, so <laughs> one problem with these surveys is when you get something extreme, you always have a small percent because some people are just messing with the survey. Yeah. Right. So some, so it'll be like, just people are just like, like, yeah. And you know, my dog, am I this, am I that? And like, they'll just, or, although maybe that's true too. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, man. How, on that one, though, how many people? Yeah, maybe that's e even so like, you know, little prankster 18 year olds yeah, would say, that, that be, yeah. I want to have sex with my mom to a stranger. They would say that. <laughs> yeah, probably not. You know what I mean? Yeah. So look what's going on in our society. It seems to me you've shown there's a whole heck of a lot of repression of this. It's clear. But also a whole lot of those who are returning in Freud's terminology. You know? With the porn stuff they're watching. Yeah. With the porn they're watching. Yeah. 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 yeah.
There, there's some, they haven't, they didn't get rid of that desire. 300 years or so right. of telling people this is the worst thing you can do. You know, it's right up there with murder, you know, which, you know, it's pedophilia also, by the way. It's not just incest, but it's also, you know, sex with a child, right? That actually is a lot less common than I was expecting. Oh, really? But it might just be because in huh. the Pornhub data, maybe because it's illegal and because there's so, that, yeah. that's an area where there's so much concern. Pedophiles know they can't go to Pornhub. Yeah. There might be so much concern about so the they don't go there. stuff that they don't. That's what it is. Yeah. I guarantee you. Oh, no. But however, however, you do know, go to Pornhub right now. Look at the top genres in Pornhub. Top, it's always top five is teens. Yeah. Well, always. that's not considered pedophilia. I understand so. that legally, but it's almost always, close. it's almost always 18 year olds. Yeah. Yeah. And who look and often. Or like who look, braces or like. Yeah. Yeah. Who look very, very young, who look younger than 18. There's no doubt that's pedophilia. I mean, you know. Right. So there's no question in my mind that there's a huge, huge desire to have yeah. sex with girls and boys. Don't you I mean, I, I agree with that. I, I was expecting, that was one where I was expecting like the, that this was like, I was expecting much more of that on the, in the, in the data I looked at. It. I, I was surprised that it wasn't higher, but I, I agree just based on instinct and also like that, that it would, that it oh, would I see. be, but I don't know. Yeah. Wait, hey, right. How do we explain it in the Google search data? I was explaining how it doesn't happen in the Pornhub data because yeah. pedophiles wouldn't go to Pornhub. Um, because I mean, people... I, there is some, there is a Google, I, yeah, I don't know. Like I was expecting it would be like right up there with like hmm. gay, like, yeah, me too. like in the five to 10% or like something huge percent of porn would be like, so how do we explain? Oh, oh, they're worried that it would, the, the cops would track, maybe, I guess, this. or maybe, or maybe it's lower than I thought, than I thought it is. We don't really know these things. We have no idea how many people are attracted to. Oh no, people. I'm oh actually, no, that's what it is. I'm Based sure if you're intelligent at all. Well, I mean, do you know how the surveillance for child porn is? I mean, how intense it is in this country? I mean, Every local yeah. police department has done like entrapment, you know, where they set people up. They pose online as a girl and say, come to this hotel and have sex and they arrest them before they walk in the room. They're basically criminalizing the desire. I mean, yeah. no, they are criminalizing the desire. There are lots of men in this country right now who are in prison for simply desiring to have sex with children who have right. just stated it. You know, well, for instance, like the, the possession of child pornography, right? You never touched a child. You never did anything to a child at all. You go to prison for a long time, like for 10, 20 years. Like they stomp on yeah. pedophiles, even just the desire. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so I can imagine if you, if you're at all intelligent and self-aware or aware of this society and you're a pedophile and really like looking at four-year-old girls having sex, you're not going to type that into a search engine. You maybe you, type for like picture, like, like gymnastics or something. No, I'm sure they do it on the dark web. Okay. I'm sure they know. Most of them are smart enough to know that. You're not going to type it because you could actually, I'm sure that the cops could find that even if you just search, uh, typed it into a Google search bar, right? They could find that, couldn't they? Uh, I don't, I don't think they can. I'm not sure. If, it, if results come up on your screen. Uh, and also, why would you do that unless you were going to click on one of the results? Yeah. yeah. So why would you even bother? I th I'm sure it's all, all in the dark web. I think I've typed some really bad stuff about like murder for my research. <laughs> Well, and murder's murder's fine. <laughs> yeah, but I don't. I mean, like, meaning, nobody's ever come to me like meaning that desire. I mean, or at least like the, I did how to kill my girlfriend. Like I, I was, I was noticed that people had searched like how to kill my girlfriend. So oh wow! Like, I got to see like what comes up. Like, is this a real search? Like, what comes up? Huh. So I had to do that search myself, and I'm like, I, I'm like, a, a whole, what, wait, what happens if someone comes and like <laughs> and like goes, but nothing happened? How do I kill my girlfriend? Yeah, That's like extreme, or like how to poison someone. Like I've done those searches because. Huh of the research for my book, I wanted to see to make sure that it came out so, right and nothing's ever happened. To so me. that's perfectly legal because you're not specifying. I okay. mean, I guess if you say my girlfriend, that could still be considered, you know, a, a generalization or, you know, whether, but if you typed in a name, that's illegal. Really? I think so. Yeah. Chosen intent to murder. That's, that's, I think that's a conspiracy or attempted murder in some way. Yeah. I mean, if you're actually making plans to murder a specific person, yeah. I mean, first of all, that's not protected speech. We know that that's not that's not covered in the First Amendment. I think it it could technically. I don't think they actually uh, would come to your. Well, I, I don't think they. I think they tend. I'm pretty sure they come to Google after the fact because all these murder investigations they're always like coming after the fact mm -hmm. for like this person did murder. Can we see their searches? Mm -hmm. But they're never like. I don't think they're keeping a track of anyone who's making a certain some searches mm -hmm. and going to their apartment because mm -hmm. I've never heard that happen. Well, at the very least, it could be used against you in a future yeah, afterwards. case. Yeah. yeah, prosecutors could use that. Well, for whatever you get in yeah. trouble for, right? They can yeah. use that for something. Prosecutors, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> potentially, you know, one fifth of America wants to fuck their mom. Thanks, Seth. Look what you did to us. No, but it's, it's really important, right? It may just, it just, it's really illuminating about what's, this, what's yeah. going on in no, this culture. Anytime you see like a huge contrast between 
it's like mind blowing. So like one of the things I have really in is. my book yeah. where I'm like, uh, one of, one of my favorite facts is the number one search, uh, uh, my husband wants in India is my husband wants me to breastfeed him. Yeah, I know. And it's like India and almost nowhere else. And it's not just like I cherry pick that phrase. It's like, if you do yeah. uh, like anything with my husband, like there's all these breastfeeding. If you do like how to breastfeed and like United States, like 99.8% of searches are how to breastfeed a baby. But in India, it's like split evenly between how to breastfeed a baby and how to breastfeed a husband. And that nobody talks about. Mm -hmm. It's like literally, uh, well, I wonder, do you know that they, that they don't talk about that in India? Well, I somebody did an article after my thing came out, and it was like they're just interviewing people, like you've never heard of this, nothing, like really? no. And I'm like, it's just so weird because it's like that's going on. Like I know in the data that there's a wide, like hmm. I don't know exactly. Again, it's hard to sometimes translate this to what percent, but like it's clearly something substantial, mm -hmm. and it's not talked about in polite company maybe like some buddies will will mention it at some point i don't know but like mm -hmm. uh definitely like it's it's so it's so amazing that like there can be this large a contrast between what everybody is talk talking about and admits to and what's actually being done yeah that is remarkable i have no explanation for it whatsoever i will say that i did actually use your methodology i did use google search terms or the data from it um, in studying the Middle East and Muslim countries, you know, I was interested in sort of popular cult popular cultures in in Muslim countries, in particular those that have some form of Sharia law, just to look at sort of like resistance or you know to that thing. Again, sort of a similar thing, just in you know, resistance to repression in yeah. those countries, though, right? And I and I think Google reported this at some point. I think it was Google. Yeah, they reported this years ago that the the country with the most searches for the word sex was Pakistan. Yeah, yeah. You heard this? Okay. Yeah. And then you'll find, but then there's all sorts of data like that for all those Muslim countries. It's like, good luck guys over there trying to repress all these desires in an extreme way. You know, it's, it's not going to work long term. That's my argument about terrorism in the Middle East and how that place is going to change. It's just changing. People are just moving away from that stuff because it's, it's impossible to live that way. But like repressing in general. So have you read, uh, Steven Pinker is a, 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 our better, better angels of our nature. Why no, violence declined? I vaguely know about it. So he's like, so he's like that, uh, you know, violence has declined so much in human society. It's one of the greatest things we've ever done. And the reason is the civil, civilizing process hmm. that basically we used to be, people used to be unable to control their impulses at all. Mm -hmm. uh, like snot would always be like coming out of them and like they, they were slobs and mm -hmm like they had violent thoughts and sexual thought, everything was just, and like the, the way that we've reduced violence, he argues is by, uh, like learning how to, to some degree it's repression. It's like learning how to get people to repress oh, yeah. uh, their instincts. Yeah. I mean, that was, so that would say that's a good thing. And then, and it, and maybe it has to, and like, he's kind of, he's kind of like, it'll kind of all goes together that the same, the civilizing process isn't just like, don't be violent. It's like sits still in school for five out for like nine hours. And like, so how does, uh, how does Pinker, I, I don't know. I haven't read the book. How does he explain world war one, world war two, the Korean war, the Vietnam war? Well, he says that even if you look at over a lo long scale of time, it's still way lower than it used to be. No. How could that be? Like no. per, per capita. Oh, per capita. Okay. But I mean, the 20th century is way more lethal than any other time in human history. I mean, those yeah, wars, not just, per capita, just the two world wars. I mean, right now the estimates among historians for world war two is between 60 and 80 million, million people dead just in that one war and world war two, world war one was not far away from that. I mean, that's, it was something like one or 2% of the world's population were killed in each war there. I mean, really? He's saying that there were more, Violent He's deaths also like per capita. Gatherers, the percent of hunter gatherers that die in violence, hmm. killing each other. Yeah, is like oh, is like shocking. Hmm. That's like how much uh, evidence do we have from the hunter gatherers? You know? Though people have criticized the book for not being yeah. for like how strong is that evidence? Yeah, but. all that all that prehistoric stuff. I'm not you know, it's fine to theorize about it, but if, there's really no evidence. I mean, you can't really prove anything. But we we have a pretty good idea of how many people were killed in World War II. You know, I. I I don't, I don't know. I don't love that, at least on the face of it, but I haven't read the book, so I won't comment further. So um, the other things you found, just we'll do sex for a little bit more and then move on to the other stuff. But uh, so you found that, oh, oh, so here's a, here's a question that, you know, I've been 
very curious about and a lot of people who do like the history of sexuality have been curious about and which is how many people are gay right how many gays do we have gays and lesbians how many are there in this in this country and still you know big question because it has of course political implications like how seriously should we take these people if there's only if they're only one percent or five percent or ten percent right that also kind of always that bothers me a little bit because like Mm -hmm. that the legitimacy of a desire depends on how frequent it is yeah oh totally isn't really fair right totally agree yeah so kinsey um the kinsey study which you mentioned I, i don't remember the number that you cite i'm sure you're right about it but what I remember is that he did the survey of these people and he found that I think it was something like 33%. It was 30 something percent of men reported having had at least one homosexual encounter, like having reached orgasm. I think it was, they reached orgasm through homosexual sex at least once. It was a third of American men reported that, right? Now, many of those, we presume, were not, didn't identify as gay and probably, you know, were mostly heterosexual, which also, you know, this speaks to the fluidity, you know, there's like people move back and forth across these lines, which is one of the things that happened after World War II is like the lines got really hardened between gay and straight. Before then there was all this fluidity and you could be married to a woman and, you know, have 90% of your sex could be heterosexual, but a lot of men would then have sex with other men, but they would still consider themselves to be straight. And most importantly, the culture considered them to be regular so-called normal heterosexual men. So, but you said that, I, I just can't remember this. Kinsey said that his claim was at what, 10%? Yeah, I think day? that's what he eventually Which became, about. and that became sort of um, this common claim made by like gay rights activists, right? That were 10%. And I always wondered about that. I forgot that it came from Kinsey. But, and you found what? You found something a little different. Well, the Kinsey study has been debunked because he basically studied, uh, the sample was a, uh, like prostitutes and prisoners, I think, mm. which is not a random sample. I think, really. well, no, it wasn't. I mean, he's, he, he, the surveys were of many kinds of people, but I think, I guess the claim is that there were, the were prisoners and prostitutes were, it over, wasn't a random sample. Overrepresented. It definitely yeah. was not a random sample. Yeah, 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 yeah. So now if you do a random sample on surveys, it's like two or 3%. Hmm. So I self identify as gay. As gay. Yeah, right. But if you look at, and the, and the thing that you see very clearly in this data is that there are a lot more men who self identify as gay in places where it's easier to be gay. So in uh, California and New York relative to Mississippi and Alabama. Now part of that is probably because men who are gay were born in Mississippi, moved to California Mm -hmm. or New York. Mm -hmm. Uh, But if you look at gay porn searches, they are a little bit higher in California and New Mm -hmm. York because there are legitimately more gay men there. Right. So if you look at like province town, which is a vacation town for all gay, pretty much for gay men, like Mm -hmm. in the summer, like, the percent that of porn that is gay is more than 50% in, mm-hmm. in promise in, in the summer. Uh, but you know, it's, 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 it's close to, I would say about 5% everywhere. So it's in that neighborhood. You kind of can say like, based on this data, it's hard to say exactly again, to translate exactly from porn data to percentage. And again, sure. gay is not necessarily the most defined thing, Yeah, but it's kind of like, it's kind of something in that range where I'd say like five, you know, I'd say 5% of male desire mm-hmm. focuses on, uh, Mm-hmm. Uh, other men um, mm-hmm. and it seems to be pretty s- similar mm-hmm. uh, in all all places which is significantly higher than the number who identify yeah, as gay definitely. so there you go so yeah. you know what that tells me is that and it's funny because i i basically have thought for quite a while now that you know that fight is over you know the shaming of homosexuality is done clearly it's not right it's, it's not in definitely in certain parts of yeah, but I think I would bet you there's a lot of people in New York City, right where we're sitting, who who uh, have searched for gay porn and don't identify as there gay. There are. Right? Well, they they might. Yeah, the, I, I, it's not. I don't think it's over anywhere. And but. and never tell anyone that they search for gay porn and watch gay porn. I agree with that. I think there's yeah. also. Uh, it's also interesting the way society shapes us. Like one of the top questions that parents have about their son, I think it might be the number one question yeah. about their son is if he's gay. Oh, re- oh, really? Yeah. So huh. you can imagine a lot of parents like. <laughs> You also like, I think parents play a lot of like games with sons. Like they're always saying like, he's such a ladies man. Or like, I think definitely they push men. They, I, I kind of want to do research on this. They definitely do push their sons, huh. even in New York or Berkeley or whatever. I think they do kind of push their sons in, in, uh, hmm. in a straight direction that that's maybe so that would put pressure on people. But yeah, that's right. So women, it's so women, it's really hard to, uh, 
to it's harder to to calculate because uh because uh not as not not all women watch porn so it's a little hard to uh to do the hmm. to do the calculation but the sh- like the striking thing about porn is the percent of women porn watched by women that is lesbian porn mm-hmm. is like 20 percent mm-hmm. and that's not just because like more lesbians watch porn and i don't think that's i don't know what this is one of the things that's weird to me because i don't think it's like uh it's like that uh they're in the closet in the same way like a gay man in mississippi is in the closet where like he's not telling anyone and really ashamed of that and really like would love to be with a man but just can't admit it to himself or can't admit it to other people because like i have a lot of female friends who like say consider themselves completely straight like are in very progressive mm-hmm. environments like being a lesbian would not be uh you know would not cause big yeah. problems in their lives but only watch lesbian porn mm-hmm. you ever spent time in the south sometime why yeah so i um there is some evidence it's mostly anecdotal i guess it's almost entirely anecdotal except for what you present that in the south there are far more gay people men and women who are we would consider them to be out meaning that it is sort of common knowledge that they are gay in their town in mississippi but there's just no discussion about it one way or the other. In other words, that there is simply less care about it, less concern about, you know, these categories, right? The actual policing of who's gay and who's not tends to happen in places like New York and San Francisco because we're all obsessed with these things. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. So it's like, uh, I was doing this research. So I did research on racist searches mm-hmm. and you do searches for, yeah. I don't know what language I use, but the N word mm-hmm. and like where, where they're, they're common and, uh, and it's then I was working with this other guy in a paper we were going to, to and you, you see the map, there, which is very different from the map we usually think. Mm-hmm. It's like, a, it's not just the South. It is a lot of the South, but it's also a place in the North and upstate New York and West Pennsylvania, Michigan. But like, it also kind of, I think, makes somewhat sense. Like the places that, that are highest are like, uh, you know, poor areas, lower levels of education, whatever. But then if you look, so then we're like, okay, let's see what happens when you do searches for, I don't know what language I use, but the F word, like the, the anti-gay word. And it's like, not Mississippi, the South at all, <laughs> even though like those are places that su- support yep. gay marriage in yep. the least numbers. And I think it's like, mm-hmm. so I think p- policy wise, they do make it hard to be gay a little bit. It's not, so, and there are more gay men in the closet there. Yes. So I don't think it's like, well, maybe, but yeah, I think, mm-hmm. but I think it's, it's a different type of, it's not as much an obsession. So it's a little bit, but I do think there are, that said, I do think there is less like gay rights and there is a little bit, there are a lot of gay guys there are probably like, it's not like you're a, you're a, a, a fag, fag say it, yeah. right? you're a fag, uh-huh. like you're a fag, you're a fag going to high school, but there is like an upset, a, a, an upset, like you go to church, everybody's mm-hmm. married. There mm-hmm. is also, uh, an expectation that, that, that you're going to get married to it, to it. So it's not as, and there is a lot of like torture by the sexuality. I actually see that the number one search after gay porn is gay test, particularly in like the South Mississippi, Tennessee, Kentucky, mm-hmm. which is people who are. I think not so comfortable with their sexuality. Hmm. So I don't think it's as simple as like, uh, that there's not, there's not an, there's not a, that it's like just easy to be gay there or anything like that. Uh, I think it's definitely, uh, it's not easy to be gay anywhere, uh, but you know, I, I do think, and again, this is anecdotal, so I can't prove it, but you know, it seems to me that in my world and I think it's your world too, you know, so the bi-coastal educated elite, we're always keeping track, you know, or, you know, oh, so-and-so, oh, he's gay. Did you know that? Right. That's one of the first things you hear about the person who's gay. Right. And so we're, we're just, we're not shaming necessarily. We don't think it's negative, but we're keeping track. We're recording, you know, we're keeping that data. It's something we care about. Whereas that's what I don't see. I have spent a fair amount of time in the South and like in a place like Savannah, Georgia, where I used to spend a lot of time, there were, <laughs> that's a very gay town. There's lots of gays and lesbians running around that town. There's a drag queen culture there. And, you know, it's, it's just people don't care nearly as much. But then you ask people, do you support gay marriage? Oh yeah. They'll say no. Yeah, totally. Same with, same with African-Americans, by the way, on that score. So African-Americans, as you know, are way more opposed to gay marriage than whites. You know, they voted against the gay marriage bill in, in California, uh, overwhelmingly, but, and this is actually, I've done, this is some of the research I've actually done for my own work. Um, lots and lots of African-Americans who grew up in the South, who grew up in Harlem in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 
you know, felt far less actual homophobia and just more, just less policing. Again, they didn't care. Same thing with Jews, by the way. Um, people think. Hey, why are you looking at me when you say? Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a quarter Jewish, so I can so I can say anything I want. Um, I kind of guessed that you might be Jewish based on your um, name. What, what gave it away? Everything about me? <laughs> eh, I'm not going to say. <laughs> um, I'm quite sure you're not gay, though. But uh, I don't know. No. Um, that oh so you know there's this sort of assumption that these rednecks down south are super anti-semitic and they're really concerned about the jews and the with their horns on their heads and all that stuff and if you spend any time in the south you immediately realize they have no idea what a jew is it just it's just not even a thing it might be an idea every once in a while like i think i think it's really hard to savannah georgia like the south's a big area savannah georgia is different than a lot of places i'm Sure. sure if you ask surveys in savannah georgia maybe you would get a higher percent of people in gay but i know when Say say they're gay, but I know only two percent of people in Mississippi say they're gay, uh, or one point five percent. So it's a lot lower. So I don't know that it's that it's uh, you know it's. I, I know that I visit Tennessee mm. recently, which is which was one of the first times I've been in the South in a while. The first thing they said is that uh, the phrase uh, that they're scared to negotiate me because they, they, they that, you mean, would Jew them Jew down, them down. <laughs> you would Jew them down. <laughs> so I yeah, don't know. so I don't know. It's exactly uh, no, no. I I think I've heard actually people in those places say that very phrase for sure. I'm saying that if Jerry Seinfeld and Woody Allen and Barbara Streisand walked right by those people, they would have no idea that they were Jewish. They're not as conscious of it. Whereas here in New York and Brooklyn, everybody's keeping track. Everybody knows who's Jewish. And if you're Jewish, I, I just you, think you all, sort of announce it. I just think right? all these things are really complicated. So like, oh, one, yeah. so like one of the things I thought, one of the things that's interesting about this research is you can sometimes find when your paranoia are justified and when they're not. So like the <laughs> mm-hmm. racism, if you're black, okay. yeah. if you're black in this country, yep. if you think that your neighbors, you live in Michigan or you live in Ohio, Pennsylvania, your place with 10, 15% black people. If you think your white neighbors are secretly going home and searching for nigger jokes <laughs> and then not hiring black people because, and not hiring black people in large numbers or not voting for Obama or supporting Donald Trump when he says racist things, Mm -hmm. but then saying nice things to you and saying they'll never be racist. Right. You're right. (laughs) Like I've seen the data confirmed. (laughs) Um, Now, if you're Jewish and you live in New York city or you live in Los Angeles or you live in Florida where, you know, 10, 15% of people are Jewish mm -hmm. and you think that 85% of your friends are going home and searching for kike jokes or like, Jew, like, is this guy Jew or like really obsessed with Judaism and, and stuff like that? And like, that's just not true. <laughs> like, I've seen the data, it's not true. Oh, well, no, but they're obsessed with Jewish identity. And I don't think so. Oh. Like, I, I didn't, I, I haven't seen that in the data to the, to yeah. that. I think non Jews are much less obsessed in, in these places with Jewish people as Jews think they are. Okay. We'll leave that aside. The racism thing. This is a major part of your book, right? Um, so, you found, first of all, that it doesn't so I much... I think you're the only one who focuses more on my I, I want to have sex with mom finding than the <laughs> Americans are racist finding. Yeah, I'm, which I, I agree with you. Oh, you do? Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah, think that's, that's the most explosive the thing inter- in the whole book. That's the more interesting one. But the racism, like you go on MSNBC or, or, or like whatever, they're going to be like <laughs> racist on that. I want to have sex with my mom. I'm the first interviewer to ask you that. I think you are the first one. Yeah. yeah. Ding dong. Yep. There you go. I get the prize. Yeah. No, it's true. It's not surprising because, you know, you saw the, you saw the title of the podcast, right? Unregistered. And that's what that is. That's, that's what your book is. It's what is unregistered yeah. in our society. Right? Yeah. We don't keep... Well, the racism is unregistered in a sense, but it's also talked about so much. It's not quite unregistered. Oh, we're, like... we're obsessed with it, but I'm yeah. saying what you found right. that people are saying online right. is not registered. Yeah. I mean, people are not allowed to say those things, yeah. right? So you found, first of all, that the big axis is not between North and South, right? It's more between East and West. Yeah, exactly. So you found more searches for the word, and I do say the word because I think it's actually important, nigger, um, in the East than the West and more sort of in the Midwest, upper Midwest. Just like the- yeah, well, like Appalachia is a big thing, like mm-hmm. West Virginia. West Virginia is like the number one state mm-hmm. and around Western Pennsylvania, Eastern Ohio, Kentucky, but also parts of the Midwest, you know, Michigan, definitely. Uh, upstate new york ohio like all of ohio but then also the south too like you know mm-hmm. that's probably less surprising but you know southern louisiana southern mississippi kind of all those areas are in the in the top in the top part but then yeah once you get west like much much lower mm-hmm. so i got some data for you um so when i spent time in the south the first thing i noticed this was in savannah atlanta birmingham alabama 
in New Orleans and parts of the Delta in the Mississippi in Mississippi was that there was when you walk into a restaurant in those places you see way more interracial groups at tables. Yeah. That there's have you noticed this? There's just far more whites and blacks just hanging out normally, just talking and having dinner and having lunch and just they're way more comfortable with each other than in the places I'm from, Berkeley and New York City and Los Angeles. Have you noticed that? Uh, this is purely anecdotal. I did notice when I went to Stanford, the football, I, I went in the summer and the football team was like hanging out, uh, like in their camp. Uh-huh. And like you think football team, like this is like the, the football team in, in like California. This is like the heart of like integration. And it was literally black tables and white tables. I could yep. not believe it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's go to any college campus. I, I, that said, I don't know. You'll I, see that. One thing I, I yeah. I, I don't want to, since you did criticize a couple of my findings. Go for it. Okay. The method, I'll, I feel like these things, like I went to the South and I saw this. Totally right? anecdotal. I, I was about to give you the real data. Okay. Yeah, no, no, I said that's anecdotal okay. completely. I don't, I would never write okay. anything based on just that. No, um, interracial. The other thing I noticed in the South, it seemed to me anecdotal was more interracial couples, just many more than in Berkeley and New York and Los Angeles, right. black and white. I'm talking about not Asian and <laughs> white guys. Um, well, it's true. So there is a higher rate of right. interracial marriage in the South than in the North and in the West. Yeah. So it's so like one place that like yeah. East, like that bi-coastal elites or whatever mm-hmm. are ruthlessly racist is in dating. <laughs> like in that scene in the data, like just, yep. it's like, uh, you know, uh, African-Americans are just punished to like such a huge degree. Meaning they're, they're ignored or shunned. Yeah. Or, yeah. Like in, in dating, uh, mm. Hmm. In, in in these areas, I think you know, that's. Uh, Wait, do you, is there data showing that there's more uh, interracial dating online in the south? I haven't seen. I haven't seen. I haven't okay. seen that. I don't know. But yeah. I mean, yeah. But in terms of marriage, which is the data we actually yeah, have, it's right. higher. It's, yeah, it's, it's higher in okay. the south. And that. So anyway, I was my anecdotal evidence was you know confirmed by this. But then the other thing, and this totally confirms what you found is that, I don't know if you know the history of the Ku Klux Klan in this country, um, but the it, it the Ku Klux Klan at its heyday, which was in the 1920s, this is when it had like 5 million members in it, it was centered in Michigan, yeah. Indiana, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ohio, yeah, yeah. right? Um, Illinois, Southern Illinois, yeah. you know, so, and that was, that was mostly Southern migrant whites you yeah. know, being racist against Southern migrant blacks. Right, right. Um, you know, anyway, but yeah, so that, that totally fits. Um, so, and then you, then you correlate that with votes for Obama, right? Well, yeah. So you, that's actually, I started this research, which is back in 2012 is there's, remember we're in a post-racial society and they asked surveys, did you hear that Obama was black? And mm-hmm. it's like, no, 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 no. Well, you see that Obama does worse than all than the previous democratic candidates like John Kerry, mm-hmm. uh, like almost perfectly correlated with yeah. places that are making the, that were making these searches. Right. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't challenge that one bit. I mean, I guess the number you came up with was what, 10%? It was like four percentage points, but that's 10% of white voters because like uh, Republican voters, people would have voted for the Republican anyway, like can't really be moved by racism. So, so. 10% of white voters are probably motiv- yeah. motivated at yeah. least in part by racism. Yeah. Uh, I buy that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, first of all, you have to say though, in part, like how, just how racist no, are they? No, I think that... Ten percent of white voters would vote for a white can would mm. vote for a black candidate instead of a white would okay. vote for, just oppose a white a black candidate just because he's black. Right. These are this is the so this, sometimes it's even more if you say like people some people might be like really liberal they're really democratic they're all racist but like they're not going to go to the Republican yep. like they're not going to totally switch based on that. Okay. Well, yeah. So well, yeah. So in other words, you showed that they would have probably voted for, for like a Kerry. Yeah. So, a white like, Democrat. Yeah, but exactly. You don't have a white Obama. It's like not even a well-defined term necessarily. With, but like, yeah. uh, that's the, that's the, t- that's what the thought experiment is supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I it's probably somewhere around there. Yeah. I believe that, um, people who are like truly racist, like actually make, you know, and the other thing is decisions based on is this isn't racist. Like, you know, the academic literature has been obsessed with this implicit bias that like you yeah. and me, everybody else has. Mm-hmm. And this is, there's nothing implicit about the stuff I was researching, oh, yeah. right? It's yeah, like, go for it. it. What? Tell us, what did you find? I mean, what were people searching for? Well, it's like nigger jokes. I uh-huh. hate niggers. Uh-huh. Like, die, <laughs> like, stupid. Like, it's like, uh-huh. that's not implicit, right? Yeah. And it's like in large numbers. It's yeah. like, you yeah. know, it's, it's a common search. Yeah, I buy it. Yeah, I totally buy it. Um, well, so, you know, 
who did anyone ever think that we were in a post-racial society after Obama? Well, after Obama, I think there was this brief period, but I don't, uh, no, I don't, I don't think, think people think that we're now. really serious even then. I mean, meaning that there was no racism in this society. That had gone to become like a small factor. Yeah, who are, I mean, so there is, so there are various kinds of what we call racism, right? I mean, there's all sorts of, you know, there's the old school racism, which is what you found, which yeah. is like, you know, basically segregationist, essentially. I'm sure those people would want to be in a segregated society if they could get away with it, right? This is where, you know, blacks are like biologically inferior and, and biologically dumb and incapable of being civilized people and therefore and we don't want to live near them all that and we would never hire them we wouldn't vote for them certainly you know essentially like no they don't want to live near them i think they want to be above them oh really well you think of slave owners oh, they oh, didn't yeah. want to live sure yeah it's like i think they get off like they live in places that are 20 percent black they could uh well who knows to- who knows but whatever i mean this is very clearly like old school yeah. you know it's in that category right of it's the, explicit yeah it's animus that's that's the term it's, animus. Oh, it's, like, it's probably more than that i mean it's like they probably think that blacks are like naturally inferior right and therefore they should be you know menial laborers or slaves or something like that i mean this is serious shit sounds like anyway so that's one category which was common you know until the 1960s and then that got shamed out of existence or at least out of the public realm you can't say that stuff and this is kind of what you found this is the racism that's unregistered meaning that it's not you can't say it yeah i mean you're you cannot say that and have a career in this right. country, it, really in any industry. Like you can't have a career in construction if you yeah. say these things, right, publicly. So there's that. But then there's, like, you know, all sorts of other forms of it's not really racism in the sense that they, there's a belief that there, there's biological inferiority and stuff like that or it's necessarily hateful or violent. But, you know, it's like thinking of blacks and that they're, you know, kind of in some fundamental way different or inferior or need to be saved by us or something, you know, these are all sorts of categories. But so I, I totally get, I buy, it makes sense to me that about 10% are old school racists in that way um, of white Americans. Um, so, I mean, what do you conclude from that? I mean, what's the, because Obama did win twice and he won by large margins. Well, I think Obama, well, he got a little bit of help from black, increased black turnout. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then uh, I think he, he was kind of the most charismatic presidential candidate ever. I think charisma is mm-hmm. like a huge part of politics. Yeah. I mean, I'm just saying, like, what do you think? What does this say about how racist America is? Oh, uh, I don't know. That's, that's what I'm getting at. If 10%, uh, 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 yeah, I, I don't know. It's like less racist than it once was uh <laughs> a, a little <laughs> a lot right a lot less racist than it once was a lot less racist than certain countries i'm sure still are yeah. uh so you know the theory you know one of the major theories about why trump won is that not so much that he's racist necessarily because i'm not even sure he's actually said anything that's technically racist but that he represents the return of the repressed well no he is the number one predictor yes. of trump's support was the racist searches well so it's not just race, right? They think, I mean, he, he represents all sorts of things that have been repressed. Like for instance, incest, <laughs> right? Oh, cause he wants to. Yeah. Cause he talks about his daughter in sexual ways, you know, and just being overtly sexual, right? Showing his sexuality off in public. You don't do that. That's not okay. Especially for politicians. So that's one thing he represents that's repressed. Um, the whole sort of self aggrandizement, you know, gold plated this and gold plated that. And I have this much money in this helicopter and that airplane and blah, blah, blah. That's not okay. Right. You can't, unless you're a rapper, you know, that in our world, you're bi-coastal elite, you know, formal culture world, Harvard and Stanford, they don't, that's not cool at all. That's a repression also that civilization imposed, which it's sort of in Freud, but you know, um, but then like he wears a suit and tie, which is another type. Of yeah. But badly sloppily this tie is too long the colors are too bright or they're just the wrong colors again he's it, he violates everything right i mean it's and his his hair you know i mean that's not respectable that's repressed i mean you're sort of in in the in this in the world's but when you the, have like i feel like the duck dynasty guy is almost more that because he has like you know the duck dynasty guy with a beard that's like this long and like his sure. hair is out he's like barely clean yeah that he, would be like more yeah neither one of them will ever be a professor at the schools that you and i come from right he'll never he'll never be writing policy at a think tank in washington you know what i mean that's that's what i'm talking about the world that you and i come from the elite schools and that class of people both economically and culturally we run the place we've been running we the, did run no no we, well no we still do i mean that's what kind of what trump trump is sort of proving this because as you've noticed like he's been like a a virus 
who's in, come into the body and all the antibodies just are attacking it from every direction, even within his administration. And, you know, the whole so-called deep state, like the entire apparatus is just trying to kill this guy every single day. Right. So it's like, good luck. You know what I mean? So it just sort of proves what's dominant, but like every once in a while, and this is basically what Freud said, every once in a while, the repressed will come back to fuck you up in a worse, and in in, they will be your worst nightmare. They will be civilization's worst nightmare. They'll want to have sex with their mothers. And then they might even be president for a minute or two. So interesting. Well, don't you think? I mean, that's kind of. I thought that. I, I, well, no, I don't come from a. I mean, I'm just learning just from this conversation. Like, I, I, I don't know. I know that you're really into these. Like, I, I, I was into just like random things, but I just find yeah. Freud interesting that like he is making all these claims without any data. Mm -hmm. And like, where's totally. Because like, I just come from this data background. Like, how do you just say like, oh, this happens and that happens? I'm like, I'm like, if you come from a data science background, you're like, wait, we should be testing these things. Like. <laughs> We should be testing what people dream about, which I also talk about in the book, or like why people make errors or like in their in their yeah. uh, speech patterns and stuff. So like, so I was just interested from that angle, but I'm definitely intrigued now by this uh, this that the repression comes back in more in you yeah. Know. So I mean, so you show that pretty clearly, it you know somewhere around ten percent of Americans think things that they are not allowed to think. You know, these are practically, illegal. Well, I think everybody thinks things they're not. Oh, no, totally. Think. I'm just saying on race, you yeah. know, that, that these things, I mean, they're not technically illegal, but they may as well be because yeah. you're, you're done. Right. If you ever say this in public, if you say, say it once in public, you lose everything. Yeah. People, you know this, right? One thing I'm really nervous about my yeah. research is that, uh, people are going to stop feeling so comfortable on Google. Cause like, even you talk about like a child porn thing or yeah. That's the, it's but true. Yeah. I'm like, fuck, you know, man, why are they <laughs> giving this me this data? I want to know how many people That's have this right. And they did, did this study after the Edward Snowden revelations where they did searches on like sensitive topics and they did drop like 4% after oh, the Snowden shit. revelation. I'm like, oh, fuck, you guys are going to kill my <laughs> Damn it. Please just That's... not be, be honest. Like, put had, yourselves out there. Yet. I hadn't thought about that. Well, that's kind of, I mean, it, what you say in the book doesn't really scare me. I think it's all fine. You know, in terms of, you, you sort of suggest that we could use this for policy, which I think is fine. You know, it depends on what policy you're talking about, but you know, it's, there's a little bit of like an indirect surveillance going on, I guess. And you are totally not to blame for this. And I'm really glad you did this book. And I think it's a fantastic thing, but you know, it is, it is a form of surveillance in a way you're kind of saying with the book, you know, I see you, I see you Americans. You know, and so I can imagine a lot of Americans taking note <laughs> that some some guy in Brooklyn is going to write a book. Some Jew in Brooklyn. Uh -huh, some Jew in Brooklyn, exactly, <laughs> um, <laughs> who loves porn too much, um, is watching us, you know, and he's going to report it to all his friends who run the place. And, well, the, the reason to be paranoid that, you know, your friends, my friends could, in, you know, put some policies in place to criminalize their thoughts. You know, so I get it. It sucks, but right. You know what I mean? Well, I tried to write it. Like I tried to emphasize anonymous and aggregate and like, you know, yeah. I definitely, I definitely do not support criminalizing, uh, any thoughts even like, Oh, good. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. I didn't know. Oh, there could be some, like, I, I don't think it's non true. Like if somebody searches, like if somebody is clearly planning a terrorist attack, mm -hmm. like looking to bomb Times Square in their searches well that already is criminalized i mean they will the fbi will show definitely show up at your house if you if you start yeah. saying that online yeah but, so it's like so i don't think it's like well that's never been covered by the yeah. first amendment or yeah. not since you know the supreme court ruled on it a long time ago yeah i mean that's a specific intent to do harm to do violent harm so that the supreme court carved that out as an exception so but yeah right i mean so yeah i do think that's what you did man i think you basically um i mean proved in a sense, you know, Freud's thesis, or you just showed that it, this is how it's played out, that this is at least one of the sort of central conflicts in this particular civilization. I think it's awesome. I think I'm, I'm like, if this data is, yeah, it's like, if you love this type of stuff, like I'm, I'm not surprised, you know, from your background that you're into this stuff. Cause like, I think people like you, like me, who are into like, what's really going on in society and a little skeptical of the crap that's being told to us. Mm -hmm. Is it like it's a gold mine and it's just like really exciting time to be into the, to like be studying this stuff because i think yeah like with freud and these guys i just think they're it's so hard to say anything without the data you're just kind of like it's like i think freud was totally brilliant and like a lot of his theories i think are, are right mm -hmm. but like he kind of was just picking shit stuff out of his, his you know a little bit like just yeah you know and i think the anecdotal stuff is always just dangerous because you see something it's very hard uh I think we tend to exaggerate things that we are ourselves feel or that a small group that we're near feel. So it's very hard to make correct theories uh, based on anecdote, I think. Mm -hmm. But like with actual data, you know, you can actually see what's really going on in society. Yeah. 
at the beginning of the interview, I said, this is the collective unconscious of a society and which by the way is Jung's term. So it's not even Freud's term. And then you said, is it a collective unconscious or the collective unspoken? So that was, you said, yeah, no, I think you're right. I think I was wrong. You were right about that. That's what this is because these are people clearly they're conscious of what they're saying. I mean, when they're typing in the terms. Yeah, so I was like, yeah, so actually I got criticized actually by Steven Pinker because I was hmm. initially saying that the mother stuff is like Freud would have a field day with like, I want to have sex with my mom. And he's like, it's not repressed to say I want to have sex with my mom. Like his theory was, well, you, you have it at the age of two and then it becomes repressed after that. Yeah. I mean, to it's the a, point, yeah, it's, not, to the point you're not Googling it. Yeah. It's culturally or socially repressed. Meaning now, yeah, but yeah. Freud would not have said that. Freud would have said it's consciously repressed, so we, people don't realize they want to have sex with their mom, but they like marry Correct. someone who looks like their mom. Yeah, but I think I think the return the return of the repressed is people being I think for Freud somewhat conscious. Does he talk about that? I think so. Not really. He doesn't lay it out because he's very vague because he's a big intellectual in Vienna, but. um yeah, I don't know. But anyway, I do think that's correct. Whatever. It's clearly conscious on some level. But the, but what I care about is that there's a conflict. This is all my work basically boiled down to this is there's a conflict between what people want, their desires, and what they're allowed by society to yeah. want. That's it. And so that's, Definitely. yeah. And so that's so important, man. The more, you know, I was excited about your book when I first heard about it. I was excited about it when I read it. I was excited about it when I heard you talk about it elsewhere and it just in this conversation now i'm like four times more excited about it <laughs> and i hope you are you, you going to continue to do this are you going to do more of this i i think i don't i i, I definitely want to i think i kind of just talking to you i think i have an instinct to take this in a weirder direction cool <laughs> but i think i but i think my editors and stuff and maybe society is trying to make this take it in a can you uh, a less weird direction can you at least hint what the weirder direction would be well no the weirder would just like be doubling down on on all the sex and all the, Ooh. and all the, yeah, like kind of grand theories of society. So and if you're like, listening, if you're listening, I want you to donate money <laughs> to Seth Stevens Davidowitz yeah, you got it right, right now to uh, do this. Cause that would be, yeah, but I don't, know if I, I don't know if I'm going to do it now. I have like a speaker. I'm like, have a speaker's bureau. I'm like, yeah. So I'm kind of like, Oh, maybe I should like how businesses can use this data to make Dude, money. No, come on, man. No, really. Do you see? I mean, it's really big. It's really, really big. No, I think it is, but it's, it's, yeah, no, I, I think ideally kind of like uh well, I said in the book, I said at the end, I said the next Freud is going to be a data scientist. The next Kinsey is going to be a data scientist. The next Marx is going to be a data scientist. Yep. The next, and I think that's totally true. It's yep. going to be, the, we're going to get a theory of, of a big theory. It's always something that's always frustrating me because I always love nonfiction. I've loved big grand theories, but they always feel to me, I've always been uncomfortable with them because they're always just like, sure. well, what's the proof? Like, okay, like you just, totally, yeah. You just said like, maybe, okay, maybe like society moves in these cycles, but like, mm -hmm. can you give me like, I want to see like graphs. I want to see regression analysis. I want to see like, yeah. here's a proof that it's actually happened. You, I feel like that's actually possible to do. You've invented a category of evidence for social science. The whole category didn't exist until you did. Well, this. I mean like, so I mean a few people, but yeah, you like really, I, I would say like, you know, like what, what I think I, I think I doubled down on some of this stuff. Like I think there were, there were people there. I, I, I don't want to get into like who's first and who invented things. Those are always weird, but I think, uh, you know, I, I think mm -hmm. I, you did it in the first serious big way. I'm, I'm proud of the work I did. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's pioneering. I like, no, I think, I think yeah, social science, yeah. <laughs> honestly, man, I think in not too long, you, this book will be a, a milestone or a landmark in social science. No doubt about it. Uh, don't you I, mean, I, 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 I thought, I think I, I kind of had this weird thing. So I do, I write in a very like joking, non-serious tone yeah. and don't take myself very seriously. And even in this conversation, like I'm kind of dressed like kind of like mm -hmm. a t-shirt. I think in my head, I'm kind of like very ambitious, but my tone is very, I'm somewhat immature and somewhat like, uh, <laughs> uh, don't take myself seriously. And I think those, that combination, I think I don't, I don't know if it lends itself to that kind of like, I'll bet you that's why you weren't too fond of being an academic. <laughs> yeah. I had a similar problem. Yeah. I, I do often feel like a child in a certain, in a certain yeah. way or, you know, but in a good way, right? Yeah. It's like, why can't we say these things? <laughs> right. Yeah. Why can't we talk about things like incest yeah. and even yeah. sex? Yeah. I mean, yeah. But I like making jokes too. Like I like, I like being, and, and there is something a little bit silly. Like I did this thing on, I wrote this New York times column about sex. Actually I was talking to my therapist about it and that was exactly my thing. I'm like, 
thanks to my work with you, I could write this article, which like, I don't feel like growing up ever. Mm-hmm. Like I want to go back to the time where it was fun when like kids farted. And, I love like, it, man. <laughs> but I, like I had this sentence where I just listed, I was talking about how, how women are obsessed with vaginal odor, which I had not known about. And is another <laughs> thing that's just revealed in this book. That's like, and, and I just listed like women are most concerned. Their vagina smells like fish followed by, and I just listed all that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a totally ridiculous sentence, but it is like also, but it's also like, is that, so it's, it, but like, that's kind of the contrast because that sentence is like actually a very important sentence in it that is. you could imagine like set, like you actually go to the website, you see that, uh, that, uh, if, if you go to like the Google search that people make about vaginal order, frequently it'll be message boards by like 16, 17 year old girls. They're paranoid. Their life is over. Mm-hmm. Like uh, the mind of a 16 year old is not. Yep is so out of control. Like yep. I, I know I've heard stories of like 13 year olds when they started growing breasts, they like thought they had breast cancer. Like the mind goes in crazy areas yep. when you're paranoid. And clearly one major area that it seems to go, uh, we now know with the collective unspoken is uh, vaginal odor. And, uh, you know, some, uh, I've talked to some people in sex ed, you know, you probably should incorporate this since it's pretty important. So it's like an important finding, but I also listed all the vaginal odors in a clearly like ridiculous way mm-hmm. that like, that's kind of the contrast between, uh, yeah. th- that's something I've always been struggling with that I'm very silly, but I think my ideas are serious. So. so you showed, you showed, that's just one example of all the shame that we feel oh, yeah. about all sorts of stuff. Oh, definitely. But in large part, our bodies about our bodies, right? Well, Cause we don't know what's normal and like, yeah, yeah we have all kinds of shame yeah. about just our bodies. Forget about. Well, I have a I have a big section on that, and also like men, you know, it's not usually talked about. Like we usually think women are the women are the are the uh, are the ones who are obsessed with their bodies, and you see in the data that's you know it's it's almost even men and women, and you know weight loss or plastic surgery, and then yep. like you know men, they're focused. Well, one of them is penis size, which is not surprising. Like that's kind of known about, but then like man boobs, mm-hmm. like which is also like it's a funny way to a funny term. But that's one that ruins men's lives, and they're concerned about getting rid of those. Oh boy! Things. Yes, like the, I know, yes, you know, I know the about that. Yes, to which like men are interested in that. It's like, you know, people are in these little like, yeah, insecure chambers of insecure, you know, of a uh, yeah, uh, you know, vulnerability and paranoia and stuff that you do see online. People live in their own personal torture chambers. Yeah, because of these things, because of things that would be laughed at, like vaginal odor or man boobs that are laughed at, that aren't taken seriously. But showing how many people have these feelings. So first of all, if I had one of those insecurities and I saw this in your book or any book and saw the numbers right away, that helps. Yeah, yeah, the shame. But also it helps to understand just how important and widespread these things are, and you know, to at least begin to talk about them so that the shame can be decreased. You know, so. Yeah, man, I, it's it's revolutionary what you did, and I really do hope you do something like this. But even if you don't, I know that many more people will. So, yeah. um, well, I kind of yeah, I kind of also you know, I ended the book. You kind of like have to think at the end of the book why did I write this book? Mm-hmm. And it's kind of one of the things like the next Freud, the next Marx. Like, I, if there's like an eighteen, nineteen, twenty year old with like the interest of like you or me or something, I kind of want to say like go in this area because like you're mm-hmm. gonna. First of all, I want to read what these people write. Yeah. Like I want to read in, in 10 years or 15 years, like some total genius that like, I don't know about right now, but it's just like, Oh, it'll happen. Yeah. But like, it's just like, is it, it like, you know, but it, it doesn't really know what they're going to do a career, but just like go in this area and like, tell me what you find. Cause I want to fucking read about it. Cause like, you know, yeah, I just, sorry. I was just thinking you thinking about the ch- being a child or wanting to be a child, what you told your therapist. I mean, I think that's it. That's it. That's what you are about. That's what this this book was created by the questions a child asks. Yeah, that's probably true. And those questions are dismissed and laughed at, not negatively necessarily in society, but they generally are not allowed in places like Harvard and Stanford and Columbia, where, where, where you and I come from. We would have to at least reframe them, yeah. but usually they're not even asked at all. Right. So you actually do have that child's mind in terms of the questions you have about the world. Question, but like that's every, it's like, it's hard to take anybody seriously when you look at porn data. <laughs> Cause like at the end of the day, like if, if, if you go walk down, you know, wall street, mm-hmm. like you see everyone, they're suit and tie, like, you know, or, you know, just similar to like, to like, you know, or you walk in a Harvard professor, like you yeah. walk in a seminar and everyone's got these like serious faces. I know. Like, I love it. Yeah. But yeah. that's like, you see what they're searching. To I know. At, and it's like, <laughs> you can't really take, take, like, it's all, I, I don't know if it's childish, but it's like, it's something that's not perspective. Like it's not, uh polished <laughs> you're not allowed to ask those questions or even to think them but you did yeah. and but, that but 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 like but everybody has like thoughts that are like not 
respectable, uh, quote unquote. I know. Everyone should go out right now, wherever you are, and go go to Main Street, whatever it is, or the business dri- district in the town you're in, or go to the local college or university and just, just sit there and watch people and know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> these things yeah. about them. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. So, Seth, thanks for this. This was, um, I knew it was going to be good. I didn't know it was going to be great. This was really great. Yeah. I love this. Likewise, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. This is great. Yeah, thanks for for having me. Cool. This was the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. If you like what you just heard and think it's worth supporting, please go to unregisteredunderground.com and become a subscriber. Thanks for listening.